AI or artificial intelligence feels like a buzzword that you just cannot escape from these days. It is everywhere. The age of AI. Artificial intelligence. AI. 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 And astrophysics is no exception, with a steady increase in the number of research papers published either employing AI tools or just mentioning them. Just last week, I went to a conference organized by the folks at Breakthrough Listen that was all about the search for life in the universe using AI tools, which is what inspired this video on how we use AI in astrophysics. So first of all, I feel like we all need to get up to speed on what AI actually is, what it can do, what it can't do, because there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation out there about AI. Then we're going to chat about four different ways that us astrophysicists use AI tools. The first being classification of data. The second being finding weird things, aka anomaly detection. The third being inference of data. And the fourth, emulation of simulations. Now this is by no means an exhaustive list. I'm sure that many of my colleagues are applying AI methods to their research in many different ways, not to mention, you know, sort of like out of the box AI tools to help with like everyday work and productivity, like GitHub's Copilot, for example, to help them write code or ChatGPT to help them summarize papers into abstracts. But before we dive into how we use AI, let's start with what actually is AI, because it's a very very big umbrella term that encompasses a lot of things in computer science, including machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning is just the very first step along the AI journey before you get to artificial general intelligence and super intelligence, where machines actually gain consciousness. And the key thing here is that we're very firmly still in the machine learning and deep learning parts of AI. We are still teaching machines to do certain things and they are going away and doing those very specific certain things that we tell them to do. We have not yet achieved any sort of machine consciousness where a machine is deciding for itself, like on its own, what to do next. For example, ChatGPT hasn't started answering questions questions that it hasn't been asked yet. Someone has to prompt it first. And there's so many films that explore this idea of machine consciousness as well. For example, the recent film Free Guy, where Ryan Reynolds plays a non-playable character in a video game that's programmed to do the same thing over and over each day, but eventually starts to think for himself, learn on his own and make decisions that he hasn't been programmed to do. We are not there yet. So when you hear people say the words AI and talk about AI, what they're really talking about is machine learning and deep learning. And you can think of them kind of like a more complex if this then that function. So machine learning is like, I showed you all the possible examples that could come out of this if this then that function. So if I show you another example, you should then be able to tell me what the answer is. Whereas deep learning is more, if I show you all of this, what are all of the possible outcomes? And then I want you to choose the most probable outcome. And oh, if that didn't work, then I want you to learn that that didn't work and then suggest to me another possible outcome. Now thinking about how we use AI and astrophysics as a whole, we have sort of a few unique different challenges when it comes to using AI tools. First of all, the size of our data sets is quite frankly ridiculous. For example, ESA's newly launched Euclid Space Telescope is set to survey two thirds of the entire sky, taking equivalent images to the Hubble Ultra Deep Field for that entire area and sending back 100 gigabytes of data per day for six years straight. Our data is also multi-dimensional, so you don't just get images, you get spectra as well with how much light at each wavelength you're receiving. Or for a single object, you might have data from multiple different telescopes all looking in a different wavelength range. So from visible light to UV, X-ray and infrared. Sometimes that data will also be incomplete with some bits missing, or it might have some very complex noise on it because the light might have traveled through the Earth's atmosphere and that might have added some 
some very chaotic, complex noise that we just can't model or quantify. Or it might be the fact that the data just spans a huge range of scales in the universe. Plus, usually that data also needs physical models to actually interpret it. For example, we measure the amount of light from a galaxy, but the physical parameter we actually need is the mass in stars in that galaxy. So we have to model for that. And so all of these issues combine together to make using AI tools in astronomy and astrophysics not exactly a straightforward task. Combine that also with the fact that our huge data sets also don't have handy labels where we've said, yes, that's what that is, before we can actually train the machine algorithm on it. So all of this to say, me and my colleagues can't exactly sort of take like black box AI tools that are provided by, you know, other software companies and always apply them to the data sets that we have. We often have to do a custom job and then be very careful with how we apply it. But before we get to how we use AI, what if you want to learn how to use AI or even how to develop it yourself? Well, the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare, is the largest online learning community for creatives with thousands of classes all taught by industry experts across tech, freelance, entrepreneurship, productivity, and so much more. So for example, if you want to get started with AI tools, whether that's how to best leverage ChatGPT as a creative, or whether you want a technical introduction to machine learning, or whether you want to know how to develop machine learning tools yourself with Python code, Skillshare has all of those classes along with curated learning paths that provide sequential class collections so you can master a very specific skill. I've been using Skillshare a lot recently because I wanted to get better at using Photoshop's AI generative image tools just because I want to up my YouTube thumbnail game a little bit more. What I really love though is how you can create and share a project after completing a class and then get really useful feedback from the whole community. So this is why Skillshare is so great. It can help you take your career, your skills, your hobbies, your passions or your side hustles to the next next level. So thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And if you want to check them out, the first 500 people who use my link in the video description down below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So get started today. But now let's chat about the different ways that we use AI in astrophysics. And let's start with classification of data. As I said, astronomy and astrophysics are a little bit notorious for their huge volumes of data. That can either be from a survey telescope, where its job is literally to split the sky into little postage stamps of images and come back night after night and take images of the entire sky, adding them together so that you can detect fainter and fainter objects all the time. You then end up with millions of objects detected across the whole sky. And this is what the Sloan Digital Sky Survey did through the 2000s. And it's what ESA's Euclid Space Telescope is going to do over the next six years at much greater detail and depth. Add on top of that, you've then got things changing in the sky every single night. From asteroids and comets moving in the solar system to new supernova appearing or just a star varying in brightness. Some surveys also report these changes every single night. And that's what the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile is set to do when it comes online next year. And it's estimated that Rubin, over its 10-year operations period, will detect 20 billion different objects in the images of the sky that it takes, but also that every single night in the 20 terabytes of data that it will take will flag 10 million objects that have changed somewhere in the sky. I mean, going through all of that data as a single researcher or as even a research team is just impossible. And in the past, people have turned to the public for help. For example, the Galaxy Zoo Project, which asks the public to classify the shapes of galaxies in images from survey telescopes. In the past, having completed classifying all 1 million images from SDSS during the 2010s. 
And it's that human effort that is so useful for AI tools because you need to train your machine learning algorithm on things that we already know, things that have already been classified and labeled. And if you give it only a tiny amount of examples, then it's going to do a really poor job on the huge data set that you then give it. So once the Rubin Observatory is up and running, the plan is to have the images being classified by the public on Galaxy Zoo, along with any of those flags that something has changed in the night sky somewhere classified on another Zooniverse project, which is sort of like a collective platform that hosts all of these citizen science projects. And I'm very excited to announce that the first batch of images from the Euclid Space Telescope is also now live on Galaxy Zoo. With the public being asked to help classify these images and being probably the first people in the entire universe to actually have seen these galaxies before. But Galaxy Zoo also has an AI algorithm sifting through the images first before showing them to volunteers. It's known as Zubot. Again, one of these examples where my colleagues have had to custom build this thing for themselves. And what it does is classify the easy ones first. You know, the things that we have loads of examples for, but the ones it's not so sure on, it then shows them to the public classifying on the website. And then those human classifications help to train the machine even more. So this is humans and machines working together in the most efficient way possible. If you want to help out classifying images with Galaxy Zoo Euclid, I'll pop the link in the video description down below. Of course, Galaxy Zoo is not the only example of this sort of classification of data in astrophysics. AI algorithms have been deployed to classify galaxies in JWST data or to find planets and data from telescopes that monitor the brightness of stars where they look for these dips when the planet passes in front of their star blocking a little bit of light, or again classifying those things that change on the sky as either supernova or common asteroids or flaring black holes. Now the second way on my list that we use AI in astrophysics is to detect anomalies the weird things in whatever parameter space you're interested in in your data set, whether that might be the unusually bright or the unusually faint or might have a strange colour. Now to do this, people often used something called unsupervised learning, where you don't actually teach the machine anything beforehand. Instead, you give it the data blind and use what's known as a clustering algorithm to lump together objects in the data that are similar. The idea of using unsupervised learning is that you don't bias the machine learning algorithm in any way beforehand with the stuff that we already know. So then we should be able to find the rare and unknown objects that we either didn't know to search for or we've missed in these huge data sets before. So again, we can classify the shapes of galaxies in this way to see if anything unexpected pops up. Now that could be like one single anomalous galaxy that's maybe going through something very strange like in its lifetime, or it could be that like one whole cluster of things that the machine has found is some weird new like type of galaxy that we've never seen before. That's particularly useful for brand new data like we're now getting with JWST where there could be many unknown unknowns. Or in preparation for the the Rubin Observatory and it's 10 million alerts per night of things that have changed in the sky, you know, either their brightness or their position or something else that we just don't even know to look for yet. We can use anomaly detection to flag the really rare events like Kilanova, but then specifically to deal with like, you know, the huge volume of data that we're going to get with Rubin, people have working on real-time detection of anomalies that can work throughout the night and then return something to astronomers in the morning to be like, hey, I went through all the things that it flagged, these all kind of fall into the known categories, but there's this really weird thing that now I think you should follow up. Having a little AI tool like that that works overnight for you while you sleep sounds great. Now the third use of AI that I have on my list is inference of data. And I think the most famous example of this is the first ever image of a black hole at the centre of the galaxy Messier 87 taken by the Event Horizon Telescope. Now this telescope combines antenna around the Earth to get an Earth-sized telescope because the bigger the telescope you have, the smaller the thing that you can see. And although super massive black holes, yes, are very massive and heavy, they are condensed into a very, very small space. So they're very, very small on the sky. So you can think of combining these multiple telescopes across the Earth as kind of like making Earth into a disco ball. And each little mirror of the disco ball is like a telescope. 
except you don't actually have telescopes everywhere, so it's like you've got pieces of mirror of the disco ball all missing. But then as the Earth rotates, it does actually fill in some of the gaps of the disco ball telescope, but not all of them. So the Event Horizon Telescope team had to develop a machine learning algorithm to infer what the missing data would look like to complete the picture. And they trained their algorithm on lots of different data sets. First on like just general images from the world that are on the internet, to actual astronomy images from other telescopes, to simulations of what people think around a black hole should actually look like. All just to see whether the image that they got out at the end changed significantly or not. And turns out it didn't. Katie Bowman from the EHT team has actually given a brilliant TED talk on this, which I'll link below if you want to check it out. And finally, the fourth way that we use AI as astrophysicists on my very non-complete list is emulation of simulations. This is similar to the inference of data in a way, but what you're doing here is sort of like interpolating the result of a simulation, using AI to predict the outcome of a simulation without having to rerun it, which is really important because some simulations take a long time to run. For example, you might run a huge suite of simulations of, say, the merger of two galaxies with a whole host of different starting inputs, like the speed they come in at, the angle that they come in at each other, and whether they're spinning in the same direction or not. So then you'd wait around for ages for all those simulations to finish running, and when they did, you'd finally then measure the physical parameters that you actually care about as an astrophysicist. So for example, you might want to know how many stars have been formed in that merger. Uh, what was the mass of the galaxy at the end? Or what shape did it end up at? Then what you could do is train a machine learning algorithm to say, if I give my simulation these inputs, these are the parameters I get out, or these inputs, and these are the parameters I get out. So the machine essentially learns the patterns underlying the simulations. So say you then wanted to tweak the input parameters ever so slightly, maybe change the angle that the galaxies came in at in the merger, then you wouldn't have to actually rerun that very computationally expensive simulation that took a huge amount of time to run. You would instead say, okay, machine learning algorithm, if I gave my simulation this input value instead, what are the physical parameters that I would get out? The AI emulates the simulation. And in the case of galaxy mergers, you might want to use that to say match a simulation to an observation and figure out the initial conditions needed to produce that real galaxy merger that you've observed. As you can imagine, this is particularly useful for people who run simulations of the entire universe by putting in all the <laughs> laws of physics. Those can take years to run. So a lot of cosmologists use this technique of emulation so that they can tweak things ever so slightly. It allows you to investigate like the ripple effects through the universe of just tweaking one bit of your hypothesis or one bit of your model. Like for example, if you changed your theory of what dark matter actually is. So there is a non-exhaustive list of ways that me and my colleagues use AI. But before I finish this video, what I really want to highlight is how how AI in astrophysics hasn't really transformed the field or opened up any new research paths in the same way that it's done in other fields. For example, AlphaFold has completely revolutionized the field of biology, allowing you to predict the structure of protein molecules. So not only did that speed up research into things like drug discovery and enzyme engineering, but it also made it possible for people to figure out like the mechanisms behind diseases, like how the disease actually worked in the body, but then also opened up like huge new research fields, especially in genomics. Whereas in astrophysics, astrophysics, because of all the limitations that I spoke about at the beginning of the video, we're still using AI to do jobs that technically in theory a human or a traditional algorithm could do, it's just that now we're just doing them faster or more efficiently. In general, it feels like in the field we're using AI to, to find things or to classify things, but then we're still doing the same science that we always would have done from there on out. It feels like AI has changed the way that we work as astrophysicists, but it's not yet changed astrophysics itself. The key word there though being 
yet. Because with the pace of advancement of AI tools and techniques that we're seeing, who knows what the next decade will bring. Ways in their research, research, and doing it. We have not achieved, achieved? Achieved? Yet achieved consciousness, conscious, oh my god, why can't I say this word? Consciousness. The size of our data set, data sits, I'm from New Zealand, I've shifted all my vowels. What you're doing is interpolating, interpolating, it's too warm. You just end up being like Hermione at the end of Half-Blood Princess Potions class, right? Just like, uh.